this podcast as the Adult Leadership Advisory Board or ALAB. Who we are in terms of ALAB is a group that focuses on issues, challenges, and difficult topics facing our community. We are working hard to develop educational programming, social tools, and fundraising initiatives to inform, include, and support adults with cystinosis, but ultimately anybody in our community, our friends, our families, our neighbors, and anybody that that might or might not be affected by cystinosis. We, as the Adult Leadership Advisory Board, are funded and work under the Cystinosis Research Network. For those of you out there who might not necessarily understand or know what cystinosis is, cystinosis is characterized by the accumulation of the amino acid or one of the amino acids, cysteine, within the cells. When the cysteine builds up in the cells, it often forms crystals and will sometimes attack certain organs and tissues, predominantly the kidneys, but also includes the eyes, muscles, thyroid, brain, pancreas, and testes. Previously, it was known that an individual born with cystinosis would not live past 10. It's pretty grim, and I'm sure many families out there were quite devastated when they had a newborn who was diagnosed with this disease, cystinosis. However, today we have members in our community living well past 50 years old. Welcome, everybody. This is the cystinosis rare journey into the unknown. And this is episode four, part two, cystinosis and bullying. And I'm Steve Schluter, one of the hosts of the podcast. And with me, as always, are Sarah Healy, Jana Healy, and Cheryl Simmons. And on our parent panel today, Jonathan Dix. He's on the executive board of directors as VP of development with the Cystinosis Research Network. And he has a daughter diagnosed with cystinosis. She was diagnosed in 2018. And Jonathan's very early in his daughter's journey, but wholly invested in the rare disease community. Also joining us is Jill Morrell. And she's the mother of Megan Morrell, who's on our A-Lab board. And Jill works on educational grants as the educational grant advisor in her hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan, along with our own Megan. And her family includes Brian and son Tyler. And also with us is Jana Riley. Hi, I'm Jana. My oldest son, Caleb, he's 16. He has cystinosis. And then um, my husband and I, we have four younger children, ages three, five, seven, and nine. So I apologize if I have to sneak out around seven o'clock my time, so. <laughs> Perfectly fine. And also with us again is Maya Doyle, and she's going to introduce herself here. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Maya Doyle. I'm a social worker and a researcher and an advocate who's been you know, walking alongside the cystinosis community for about 20 years now. Um, I'm currently a professor at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Shall we kick it off? Yeah. Um, so today we're really focusing on the social impact of living with cystinosis. Last week we spoke with young adults and adults, and we talked about bullying and bias, being judged, and also just uncomfortable social situations with cystinosis. Today, we're talking with parents, um, both about what their teen and adult children have experienced, and also what concerns parents have for their younger children, for their school-age kids, and just what happens when others in the community don't really understand your child's diagnosis. And we really want to think about strategies and supports that can help. So we're really lucky to have this forum um, where people can really talk openly and honestly about these experiences and concerns. So I really want to thank all of you for joining us for the podcast today. So we'll talk more about maybe specific settings in a little bit, but maybe you all can just start by telling us sort of what challenges you've seen your child or teen or young adult face, and are there any moments or episodes that really stand out for you? This is Jill Morrill, and I can start. So my daughter Megan now is 24 years old, so we've gotten through a lot of those difficult young teenage times. I think they're most impressionable around, you know, the middle school age where kids can be a little more brutal and not have filters because I think by bullying a little, they, it makes themselves, it fluffs their own feathers up. So Megan had some uncomfortable situations in middle school. 
she wasn't really teased and bullied to her face, but it was behind the scenes. She would hear kids whispering like, you know, something really smells in this room. And I think Megan always assumes that still at age 24, her biggest fear is the odor. And I know we're going to get into that a little later, but in middle school, she was really self-conscious about that and she'd get nervous and she'd sweat a lot. Like she'd sweat through her shirts and then she'd put a sweatshirt on and, and then she'd get so hot, you know, and, and you know how uncomfortable our, our kids with cystinosis get when they're overheated. She just never really wanted to go to school and she really had a hard time getting there. Um, what we did do was she had one of her best friends as her locker buddy, like next to her. Her locker was next to her. And that girl, she'd come over every single morning and go to school with Megan, which was a huge help because she was really funny and upbeat and was always singing crazy songs and making the morning really fun. She's one of those morning people that helped Megan get to school. And then while she was at school, the vice principal was awesome and gave her like a separate bathroom to go in. She still had her G-tube at that time. In sixth grade, she did and had to um, do her meds via her G-tube and stuff at lunch. And they had a whole private little bathroom and this gal would decorate it for all the holidays. So people did what they could to make her feel comfortable. Megan just didn't want really anyone to know she had cystinosis. That was her biggest fear is just being the awkward girl. And she really felt that in middle school. And I don't know if she put that on herself a lot, but she says it was hard. She said middle school was hard. So those are some of her challenges during that age. Thanks for sharing that, Joe. Jenna or Jonathan, you want to jump in with any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I can, I don't know. I, I feel like in a way that this is kind of like a crystal ball into all the things that are kind of coming, you know? And so I, you know, while I do have, have a young one, so I don't have, you know, Eleanor is only five right now. You know, we thought that maybe her story could kind of lend a little bit of fidelity to this as well. And then also just for the, for, you know, self-serving purpose, you know, as her father, you know, it, it's really, really important to, to understand that, that this is something that's going to be here and we're going to see, we don't see it so much in, in kids bullying Elle or anything right now. I mean, she's young, uh, we're going through COVID right now. So a lot of the, the extra interactions with kids have been muted a bit. And so that's, um, you know, what, what that means is that it's a lot of interaction with family and friends, which is good. So she's, you know, obviously she's very social, uh, just like her dad. I think the things that we find are more so with other adults, if you can believe it, you know, kind of forget that, you know, some of these kids that are bullying, you know, in, in middle school in those times are learning that from somewhere else, right? And so... I'm starting to kind of see some of the parents <laughs> that I probably would have a problem with their kids with just in the way we interact on day-to-day -day things. And so it's like the hush kind of tones and, you know, the eyes kind of glued to your child, you know, and um, for, for us, you know, Elle's perfect proportion. It doesn't look like anything's going on. The only difference is, is that she's very small, you know, and then, you know, and so when you juxtapose um, this tiny little, tiny little girl next to her gargantuan six foot six dad, you know, everybody kind of looks and kind of is hushed and there's, you know, small little hushed tones. And so what we wrestled with a lot was was trying to be able to explain things and not have the feeling of wanting to like choke somebody out, you know? And and, and I think that the, it was like this thin line that I was running because I took everything so personally um, and I still do um, because of everything that she had been through. She had a very storied diagnosis and it was, you know, two and a half years of just constant ignoring by so many different subspecialties and everybody was very myopic in their viewpoint on what they thought was going on to the point where you know people were telling us well she's just being stubborn and she doesn't want to eat food right i mean it just it blows your mind you know the idea of some of these diagnoses that they come up with um that you know basically just pipeline you down one thing and have you ignore everything else and so we, we saw a lot of that pushback from young residents in the hospital. And so that was that was something from my standpoint that we had to advocate for very, very early on. And it's something I think that's gonna be a through line with Elle as she gets older, is just that to always be an advocating piece, trying so hard not to helicopter on certain things, but at the same time too, you know, using that kind of systems process that I have as an ER nurse that says like, you know, you're looking at the stuff that's coming down the pipeline. And so you wanna be careful not to lead them into a situation that could get them into trouble. And so I think that's one of the things that I kind of obsess over is just making sure that, you know, I'm arming 
not only her, but also my son Finley, who's a year and a half now, who doesn't have cystinosis, with the kind of you know toolkit that's there to be able to mitigate a lot of these circumstances that come up. You know, and Elle is going to have probably her biggest advocate and her little brother, you know, around her all the time, and the two of them are inseparable. So um, it's going to be you know interesting to kind of see you know what the next you know ten years going to look like for her. But you know, the idea is that in those ten years. We don't shirk away from, you know, the issues with the diagnosis. She understands that there's a smell. I mean, my daughter is very, I mean, she will, <laughs> this kid does not mind farting. I mean, like, this is the reality of having, you know, cystinosis. I mean, the, the, she's on a she's on a G-tube feed for 14 hours out of the day because she's got a swallowing intolerance uh, because she had an NG for so long when she was so little, you know. And, and so, like, the, the G-tube feeds... You know, I mean, they make her fart, and so we own it. It's just like, all right, you know, like this is what it's going to be. Um, like, I, I'm not making her feel bad because her body is doing something that it should be doing. You know, and so, um, so, so we kind of we own that whole thing. And you know, I mean, we got plenty of sticky farts that come around the house, and it's funny to her, and it's still funny to me. I mean, it always will be. It hurts her feelings. Yeah. And so, it, you know, it, it's just I think that we're doing the best we can with what we have now, and I think that offshoots like this with a lab i think this is just so important and so incredible to be able to have these kind of candid moments where we come together and just kind of talk about everything from the perspectives of what we know it as you know and so i know my perspective really really well but i don't know the perspective from your guys point of view and so it's you know obviously you can see as, as my title is the vp of development that i am completely invested in the system community i'm completely invested i'm going to be here until i die so for me I want to lend as much as I can, and I want to grow as much as I can, not only for myself, but also for all the, uh, the kiddos, and then for, for you guys. I mean, you guys are the pioneers. I mean, I'm, I'm in awe of you guys. So I want there to be that same level of respect when Eleanor gets to your age, God willing. So, yeah, that was a long-winded answer. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Jano, go ahead. Um, so when Caleb was first diagnosed, he was only five or six years old. So he was diagnosed a little bit later in so the biggest struggle we had in the beginning was his short stature. So until he was like nine or 10 years old, he wore a 4T clothing size. So that was probably tougher for me than it was for him. So he goes to a school where it's K through 12. So when he was in second and third grade, these juniors and seniors were just in awe of how small he was and lifting him up and so not so much bullying, but I think he had a tougher time with the transition of, you know, once he got on growth hormone shots and, you know, he wasn't getting as much attention as that little person. So, I mean, it's kind of a different angle of things, but overall we were very blessed in the journey that he really wasn't bullied a whole lot. And when he was, I think I shed more tears over it than he did. He just kind of brushed things off. And I do think that boys are a little bit more kind than girls overall, you know, just in that bullying aspect of things. So, you know, from my perspective, I mean, it's probably a little easier for me having a boy with the stenosis than a girl, but not saying the journey has been easy, but overall, you know, he's, he's done well with it. Uh, a lot of it too is choosing good people to surround you. Um, like the friends he's had, they, you know, that he's, he's actually had sleepovers and um, he kind of has that attitude almost too much so of, well, I'm going to wet the bed and it's fine. And, you know, so, um, you know, it is good to, you know, have your kids accountable for things, but on the other hand, let them know that things are okay. Um, one thing we struggle with now is him asking for help and communicating. He is uh, pretty stubborn when it comes to uh, communicating things that are bothering him. So right now, I mean, he has caught up in the growth curve, but at the same time, he's not as physically strong as a lot of the other boys on his basketball team. And, you know, he just does want to live a normal life. And um, I would say he is as much as possible, but bullying actually hasn't been too much of an issue for us, which we're grateful for. That's good to hear. A lab folks, do you have any thoughts or responses to what we've heard so far? Yeah, um, just thinking about what Jill said, I would say the majority of the bullying that I've experienced has been behind the scenes. Um, or like I was talking about with our last recording, um, 
more kind of adults with bosses, it's been more polite. <laughs> if that yeah. makes sense. Like it's still, it's still kind of bullying, but it's wrapped in the veneer of, of politeness <laughs> or, you know, I always try to use knowledge in order to combat any bullying. Um, because a lot of times when bullying happens, it's, it happens from a misunderstanding of why, you know, why is this person this way? And it seems like explaining, you know, why, why something's going on helps <laughs> not all the times. It definitely depends on the the person, you know, how, how mature they are. And, and if, if you're talking about like middle, middle school kids, the, this, the maturity level for the most part is, isn't, uh, you know, quite up, up to snuff yet. <laughs> yeah, but I, I definitely have, I find, find with uh, in the adult world, for sure that that helps ex explaining, giving knowledge. I, I've had, a, I had one awkward situation. It was, it was actually with my niece. And it wasn't, she wasn't trying to be mean or anything. You know, she was just, she was, she was little. And, and uh, she noticed that Uncle Steve, when I was uh, pulling her and swimming around her, has, has a smell. And I, I don't know, you know, what, what that is. And as soon as I explained it, she was completely fine with it. And she never asked me about it again. So yeah, in a lot of cases, not knowledge, ex explaining why, why uh, you know, we, we smell or have doctor's appointments. I think that helps. Yeah. Um, this is Cheryl. I can, I can speak, yeah, to Steve, what you said. Um, I definitely had a few situations with like my niece or like, um, I lived with a friend who had a, a young child. And so definitely knowledge part of my friend's, um, kid in terms of asking, Oh, like what, what's going on? Cause I would take so many pills. So I'd explain to her sort of at a young age and, and sort of adjust my language that I, I, you know, I have a kidney that inside of me and kind of explaining that aspect and how it doesn't work and I have to take my meds and and when I take them sometimes there's an odor because she's also expressed that and my niece as well um, my my own niece has said kind of said like auntie why do you stink like you stink <laughs> and I mean all, you know the children are so honest right so yeah. they just are trying to learn they're just these little ships of of and vessels of of, of sort of information that they're taking in so I just explain the same sort of thing a, a different language a young a young child's language explaining my body and what happens and why I'm not sick I wouldn't use that word but why my my kidney doesn't function properly and this is a kidney um, and so I have to take these medications and, and they don't smell but you know what you would help me out if you could tell me auntie um, your breast smells you know or like auntie do you have some orange juice because <laughs> orange juice or, or something citric often combats that odor um, but speaking to Jill, yeah, it's interesting with the um, small size and, and sort of individuals with cystinosis um, have stunted growth um, because I've definitely been, uh, as a female, picked up a lot. Um, so it's interesting to hear you say males do too, like, oh, just throw her around and, <laughs> you know, and that was a fun aspect. I never really considered that bullying. It, it was a little bit of a, and we've talked about this in, in a, the previous episode with the um, young adult teen panel previously. Um, the almost discrimination but as you get older because when it was when I was young it was just funny like oh pick her up and throw her around toss her around right <laughs> um you almost like for me I almost start to feel like I might not be taken serious because I'm so short and typically someone who's shorter comes off as younger um younger looking so it's almost like a discrimination that's not intentional um, but we did talk about that and it's an interesting yeah. conversation uh, that stunted growth so i like wear my blazers and wear my heels and come off as confident like even if i'm not <laughs> i try yeah. to be to fake that confidence in the workplace as i get older um fake it till you make it i say or fake it till you become it um so that's an interesting aspect because we've definitely dealt with that and i feel that 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 shortness but it's good to hear your son is is confident <laughs> or comes off as confident at a young age that's excellent yeah. And Jill, <laughs> um, <laughs> your daughter's Megan, our very own Megan. <laughs> yeah. Megan. Uh, I can attest to the odor as well, for sure, growing up in that teen dating sort of uncomfortable um, time or, or phase in your life. And it's difficult, but for sure, for sure, that friend, wherever it might be in, in middle school, in high school, even someone that I've attached to in a work environment mm -hmm. to say, hey, just knock on, knock on my shoulder, give me a little tap, 
like the head nod sort of thing, like, okay. And what helped me was oils. I used oils, like just on my, my wrist or kind of under the ears just to, to, to sort of mask that scent, but for sure having that body to just give you a little like nose nod or a little head nod, like, yep, it's, it's not great. Right. So finding those things or those gums and breast sprays that will help you in that sense. Um, and Jonathan, yeah, like it's, it's going to be okay, <laughs> especially because you're so involved in, in the different aspects of the community, right? Getting that advice, like there's so much more support out there than there used to be. A big part of it is these types of platforms and social media, like it's great to just get that information, you know, and sometimes it's plant that seed as your child gets older, not necessarily um, tell them what to do, but just sort of plant that seed and give them some information as you're learning and and hopefully they'll, they'll kind of reach out to the community a little bit as well. Everyone's different, but it's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jana here. Um, so basically, Sarah and I, growing up, we had a little bit different experience. We were picked on because of our size, but they also uh, went after it, the aspect that we drank a lot of water. So we would carry around these huge water bottles when we were like in grade school, and they would always kind of poke fun at us for that. Even if we would explain about it, uh, the more we explained, the more the parents became concerned and started asking. I didn't know until later, but they started asking if they could catch it, if it was like something they could catch and get sick from. So it was a lot of our parents explaining things and we, uh, we did explain things in high school, but that kind of went wrong too. We probably could have done a better job. Uh, they, when we gave, gave a presentation in class, uh, rumors spread around in high school that we were gonna die, which, you know, is kind of ignorance on their part. Some people did ask questions and we would answer them and they would understand more. It's, it's just kind of depends on who the person was and if they were willing to listen and accept uh, who we were as, as uh, people with cystinosis and what that meant, so. Yeah, we never really got bullied to our face, but I think that is because our dad was a teacher in junior high and knew everybody in the high school and he was a very outgoing teacher. So they all kind of talked behind our back. They never really bullied to our face, but I mean, it also helped though on the medical side that our mom was a lab technician. So when we were younger, like in our toddler years, they figured out something was wrong with us because we weren't eating, we weren't drinking. And they, at first the doctors, because we were lived in a small town, Williston, North Dakota. So at first the doctors thought we were malnutritious and they weren't feeding us. So they thought we were being abused by them. And then they thought it was a vitamin D deficiency, but it turned out not to be that either. So they sent us to a specialty clinic at the University of Minnesota where a fellow, not the actual doctor, but a fellow took uh, interest in us and started researching the cystinosis. And once he found out that is that we had cystinosis and he researched it and found everything he could on it. And cause we were back in 1983, they didn't really have a drug or anything for it. So he found a trial for us and we got into the trial with the drugs and we were able to get on it at an early age. I think they started us when we were like two years old. So mom's already always been like an advocate for us since she's been in the medical field and she knows what questions to ask. And she was always, she was always in our corner and she would always make sure the doctors were going the right path and not, you know, confusing it for something. So you guys bring up so many issues. We have to decide where to dig in next. Um, one of the things I was thinking about, and Sarah and Jenny, you kind of brought this up about presenting in school. And I'm curious to ask um, Jill and Jana, did you have any strategies for going in and talking to your kids' school or preparing them, either the staff or the other kids? This might be useful for Jonathan to hear about. Yeah, one year. So when Megan was young, um, like kindergarten back then was only a half a day. 
and kids were allowed to have water bottles on their desk. Like things changed, I think, from the 1980s, from, you know, the early 2000s when Megan was in school with, with those sort of things. So all that was kind of normal. I just let the teacher know, you know, cause sometimes they have like that circle time, no interruptions. You have to listen to the teacher, da, 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 da. I said, well, she may have to go to the bathroom. And if she doesn't, you may have an accident. So you got to let this one go. But one year I did go in, I think it was in fourth grade. And I did bring in, I wanted, cause I felt like the school wasn't taking it seriously. We didn't have a school nurse. I went in every day at lunch and did meds for Megan. I literally quit my job. I was a fourth grade elementary school teacher. And I literally stopped. I was then, and I went part-time for a year and that didn't work. I turned into a full-time at-home mom to take, you know, because of Megan's medical needs. And, um, and finally in about fourth grade, I went in and I showed them a G-tube and I showed them this is in her stomach and I showed them her syringe, her things. And at this point, we were trying to transition Megan into doing her own meds, putting her own, you know, pumping her own meds in her stomach. And she was pretty good at it at home. So they did give her a separate bathroom at the, it was a teacher's bathroom that they didn't use much. And so she could keep her stuff in there. And, um, and she had a little refrigerator and it was locked and the teacher would unlock it at lunch and she'd go in and do her own meds. But I did have to go in and like, I kind of needed the shock value because I felt like no one was taking it seriously. And yeah, so I just needed the adults to know like, this is a big deal. Like, I don't think anyone realized. I just came up and did her meds privately at lunch and off she went. And, but she wasn't always feeling good. And, and she, you know, so anyways, I, I did do that. So... Um, yeah, I forgot your question though. I think I went off base. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I started rambling, <laughs> but I didn't I, go off base at all. We told I did do that. And it, it, like, how we managed school. Yeah. And she had a five Oh, I forgot what it's called a five Oh four or a five Oh three B or I don't know. Um, and, and so I did always, um, you know, meet and wrote a letter and I had a letter to the teachers just saying, this is Megan's history. I just want you to be aware. I, I had a hard time letting her go. Like I was, I was protective of her. I just wanted her to be a happy kid, you know? And for the most part, she really was. I think the younger years are just hard when they're still in the G-tube phase. And, you know, she was on that, like, um, Jonathan's daughter for 12 hours a day, you know, we'd hook her up at seven at night and unhook her at seven in the morning. And we'd be up all night long, every three hours, changing pull-ups and blue pads. And, and Brian and I would alternate our times up. It was so hard, you know, just to get your sleep and Brian had to go to work. And yeah, I was really blessed to be able to be home at that time. We were just, we just hunkered down and I was really blessed to be home and I come from a very medical family too. So both sides of our family, we have doctors and everyone was involved in, you know, helping and trying to help us out, but I couldn't leave her side. You know, I just, if she wanted me, we became very attached um, emotionally. Like I could tell if she was, I'm like, Megan, are you thirsty? Yeah. I mean, she was a little bit shy. She wasn't like Jonathan's daughter, totally outgoing. I love that. I just think she's the cutest little button. Megan was super shy and she didn't really gain her confidence till college, I have to say. So, and then she just blossomed, you know. We wanna hear more about college in a little bit, but Jenna, you wanna talk about your school experience? It's kind of amazing that you've been in one school system with consistent kids. That makes a real difference, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, the teachers have always been very supportive. Um, I feel bad for your situation because um, they would give him his meds and um, we live in Minnesota and I don't know if anyone's heard of the term Minnesota kind. I mean, people <laughs> <laughs> almost yeah, like go above and beyond, which was a great thing. But on the flip side to it, one thing um, that I have personally struggled with is as Caleb gets older, I still wanted that connection that um, you know, that Jill was talking about, like where, um, you know, you're, you're kind of a part of each other where, yeah. you know, I was still like, even to this day, my husband has to remind me, you need to back off. He's oh. getting older and more independent. And so 
So yes, the school had been, has been amazing. Uh, one thing, uh, Caleb's a junior in high school this year, and he has never had any kind of a care plan, which I think, I don't know if that's a state regulated thing or nation regulated thing, but now there's laws stating that schools need to administer those beds. Like they are liable for that. We never had to deal with that because the school was also, or they were always very wonderful about making sure he took his meds at lunchtime. And, but now he is starting to take, in Minnesota, we could do uh, post-secondary classes. So he's actually doing online schooling now through a commu local community college. And we did set up, a, is it 501 plan or I forgot what it's called, yeah. but um, something where he- 504. Can, 504, yeah, sorry. So, um, <laughs> You know, and he's very stubborn. He didn't want to do it. And, but I would felt better about him having this in place now. So then in the future, if he needs a note taker or mm -hmm. longer time to take tests or uh, excuse to go to the bathroom during, during a lecture or during a test. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and so far he hasn't had to, you know, disclose any of that information to his uh, professors, but, you know, at least we have that. So if there is an issue with it, it's set in place. So um, like for Jonathan, I would say, you know, make sure that, you know, even if you don't need some of these things, it's better to overkill them than underkill. So some people then do realize the seriousness of, of the situation. Megan never really needed the um, 504 assistance per se, because I went up, you know, we didn't have a nurse, so things have changed. But when she came to the age where she'd take her SATs, and all that, you know, those lawn exams you sit there yeah. for, she, that 504 plan then was a blessing because she was able to go into a, a private room with a proctor. They would stop the clock if she had to run to the bathroom or if she wasn't feeling good um, just to get a little food in her tummy or if during that time she'd take her meds. They could then stop the clock, which is never really allowed. But in these cases, that plan came in handy and we didn't really realize the benefits of it. So I was really happy we had that set up at a young age and it followed her every year. And so. Just to remind you guys, so the 504 plans are really designed and they're, they're all um, federally required, part of the IDEA laws about, you know, a free and accessible and equal education uh, for everybody. So 504s really deal with any of the medical things that might impinge on your child's ability to learn. And then also if there are specific learning challenges, then you have the right to the individualized education plan, which is more about sort of the cognitive and learning stuff or sometimes the sort of social and emotional behavioral stuff that the school then has to set goals and work towards. So you might have both or some people only have one or the other. So it's just, you know, good to sort of have in the education right, that go to college with you. in that independent educational plan, that's an IEP, right? So you'll hear those words, IEP, yeah. A lab yeah, called kind of, any thoughts about school and Jonathan, I want you to sorry, go ahead, chime in. No, I was just I was just saying, I mean, uh, again, Jana, I think, you know, um, what kind of struck me about, you know, Jill as well. I mean, what's what's striking me here is that it's the kind of the thing that you you, you need to have your expectations managed and you need to manage your expectations well almost right and so it that makes sense to me you know um and it's awesome hearing you know your story of, of all the kids you know coming up to the same school system and you know it's um they they know what to expect you know when when caleb comes in or when, when caleb came in um it sounds like so it's uh um you know my wife is a, is a school teacher and she's um and actually an early intervention specialist and so she works with kids um, on the on the spectrum, kids with apraxia as well, and so um, again, we're just kind of blessed with the fact that she does IEPs and 504s yeah. all the time, you know. And so, I mean, you're right; you can have either or, but some of the kids will have have both that are on board that need a little bit more, um, you know, modulation and work with things. I mean, none of this stuff is a linear pattern where the kid just learns this, 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 and this. Um, so everything kind of has to be tailored. So that makes a lot of sense. That idea of the of the note taker, I, you know, it, um, it's just kind of things that I'm thinking about for later on down the road for college, if that's, you know, what I wants to do. Um, you know, so this is, it's definitely, it's definitely eye-opening. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna homeschool Elle. Um, we had had that plan before she was even diagnosed. And so 
um, once the diagnosis happened, um, you know, we just kind of decided that, you know, if, you know, the things that we can control right now, let's control that. Let's make sure that, you know, that she's getting a, a really, really good education. But then also keeping in mind, though, that since this is a homeschool, we have to you know, work really hard to make sure she's having those those uh, those good social interactions um, and, and and being a kid and doing all those things, you know, that um, that sometimes you think go away with with like the chronicity of illness or like a chronic illness, that idea, that old antiquated model of, you know, the kids sitting, looking out the window at all the other kids playing. Um, you know, there are going to be times where that's going on. You know, it's definitely going to have to get a, a kidney transplant very early. Um, you know, her, her lack of care, or lack of a good care plan in the beginning really uh, put her kidneys um, at the brunt of it. And so, you know, she's sitting right around 45 now at five years. So, so we're definitely, that's, that's definitely something that's coming up. So um, it's good to have these, these moments of, of kind of clarity that there is kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, for, for sure right now, in this stage of the game, you know, it is a lot of sleepless nights and it is a lot of obsessing over, you know, care and how to streamline this or what mistake did I make here? And John, you moron, I'm like, come on, you, you know, better than, you know, and so there's a lot of, you know, mom and dad guilt that goes into a lot of things now, but, um, you know, I, I just, like I said, I mean, I'm kind of sitting on the back here taking notes because this is um, it's just incredible to see, you know, parents that have kids that, kind of gotten through this this very monumental stage and then to see you know you guys here that yourself as you know cystinosis patients blossoming and doing what it is you want to do you know and so I'll, I'll never forget the feeling that I had when I stepped into our first conference in Philly you know and just realizing that we weren't alone you know and I think that um, that that's meant everything and I think it's also just a reason why I just want things to get back to normal again. I miss, I miss my family, you know? Yeah. So speaking to uh, John, what you just said, I actually had my first transplant when I was 11. Um, so I was really young. My dad donated a kidney to me. Um, I can say that it didn't phase me very well, <laughs> very much compared to when my second transplant happened at 31. Obviously that's a lot more difficult because you're independent and you have a career, et cetera. Um, but I was young. And I remember thinking, you know, it, it, it didn't really phase me. Um, my parents kind of normalized things. They brought my sister. We had a little superstore to take out, like, you know, you take out your food and a little plastic, like, um, cash register and just, like, having fun and making it sort of, hey, this is just a little playroom in the hospital <laughs> and you're going to be okay. And yeah. um, my appetite, my, I, remember, I remember my doctor saying, like, you know, you might not want to eat for a few days. It, it's kind of, that's normal, it's okay. And like they left and I was thinking in my head, like I'm starving and I ate my tray of food and I ate my dad's tray of food. And like, I just, <laughs> it was like, I just got this new life. And I think that's what you can focus on, Jonathan, is that your child's just gonna have this new amazing life, like this little like new personality. My parents almost yeah. describe it as like, you became this this, this child with a voice <laughs> like, yeah. and gained some, some confidence. Um, Jill, I can speak to you. Like, um, I was like Megan. I, um, in in the school system, um, I was I was very quiet when I was young. I was pretty shy um, in terms of my personality. Even after my transplant, I was I was pretty quiet. I mean, I was louder at home, but <laughs> more yeah. voice voice yeah. at home. Um, my parents had said one at one point, you know, you, you just it just said, no, I'm not doing that. And and we'd never heard that from you. And we just, we stared at each other and, and you and we didn't know what to do because we never heard <laughs> that voice from you. Like I was probably just a little sick, but it's, it's, it was, it's great. Like it, it didn't phase me. My parents normalized things for me. I had the little personality afterwards and I felt probably just felt a lot better. So it's great. It was great. Um, but yeah, definitely growing up, I didn't, I didn't really gain that confidence even until after college. Like it was probably my first career when I was, you know, in my twenties, by the time I gained some, um, maybe more ultra confidence, like, like where I didn't have to necessarily fake it as much anymore. I was just a little bit more confident, um, up to today where I'm still that way. Um, I have a voice, you know, I learned at a young age, but I, but I honed it in my, you know, twenties and thirties. Um, but my parents in terms of uh, school situations. Um, my dad worked just like you, Jill. My mom um, worked in the school, my school. So that's another topic. <laughs> I'm not sure if I like that very much, but <laughs> she volunteered and then she worked in my school. Um, so, 
so she did come in. She did give me water. It was, um, there wasn't really kids having a lot of water, having that water bottle, um, a little lunch kit with water bottles in it. So that was definitely not um, understood, I guess, by my peers. You know, why are you doing that? At a young, young age, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, I didn't really know. I, as I said, I was shy. I didn't really know how to explain it. I didn't know. Um, Steve, I wish, you know, <laughs> I could know you and <laughs> you could share that perspective of give give children knowledge give your peers knowledge of what's going on but I was shy and and it wasn't um it wasn't seen as I guess it was seen as an odd thing for my peers to have all this water and why are you drinking so much and then um I didn't really have a, a teacher who like, like, like when I was in grade seven I had a phenomenal teacher um and it happened to be the time when I had my transplant when I was in grade seven um and she, I, when I left, I had to leave for, you know, two months. It's changed. Uh, you don't have to uh, kind of isolate and and, and uh, do that whole isolation thing after transplant as long. But um, this was 97. So this was quite a long time ago, 1997. Um, so I was gone for, you know, almost two months. And she did a phenomenal job, my teacher, in explaining to my peers what I was going through. And, and at the time in my mind at 11, I was probably... I would probably think, oh, why did you do that? You just made things so weird for me. Why did you, you say that to my peers? But in the end, um, I wasn't, you know, that bullying, I wasn't really bullied. It was, I think kids understood and grade seven, you're a bit older. Um, I did sometimes have the odd odor smell comment. Um, I experienced it to my face a lot more than behind my, my back. People, students had said things to me. So that was really difficult. Um, and so anyways, yeah, so my, my teacher did a phenomenal job in grade seven of explaining things. So I, I think from that point on, it wasn't, I wasn't uh, bullied to my face anymore. It was more normalized. It, it, like that knowledge, right? That knowledge piece of like the, the, my peers understood what was going on and they're not going to say anything to me. Um, so that was, that was, that was super helpful. Um, my parents, obviously, my mom obviously didn't, you know, come to school with me or do anything like that by that point. Um, and my mom being in the school system with me, I mean, sure, I didn't really like that, but it didn't, it didn't make things worse. I'll just say that. It didn't really make things worse. It, it sort of helped me knowing that she was there, even though on the outside, I expressed like, oh, yeah, my mom works here. Like, that sucks. <laughs> but I think internal, internally, I appreciated that, um, having her around and doing, doing things like that. Jill, I, I don't know if I should say this, but I, I, I do know Megan. We have gotten to know each other um, quite well. And she speaks to, uh, often speaks to how you and, and your and your husband, you just let her do whatever. You let her be normal. You let her take part in whatever she wanted to. And it seems like she had a very happy childhood. So, I mean, that's a key oh, thing. It's just not bubbling yeah. yeah, Yeah, no, she definitely has expressed that a number of times. So so I think it's important to, to remember that your child you know, isn't cystinosis because we get so wrapped up in it, right? They're not cystinosis. There's so much more. Aside from, you know, tackle real football, <laughs> they can't <laughs> right. do that. But they can do anything else. You know, right. like I, I rock climb and I go up mountains outside. Like it, they can do, they can do whatever I want. And it's, it's not, it's not that you intentionally, you know, my parents intentionally kind of were that hovering parent or that bubble parent. It's just, you don't, you don't know any better. And all I can speak yeah. to is you're doing the best you can, whatever decisions you make, however you do things, you're doing the best you can. And that's all that matters, right? Like at the end of the day, there's no manual. <laughs> yeah. So just, just keep doing what you do because you're doing the best you can and that's all, all you can do. Right. Um, yeah. So you guys are, you're awesome. <laughs> all of you. Yeah. But help Megan too, is having a, um, something outside, like, like you said, a sport or something to do. Like she got into horseback riding really young and, and she showed horses um, in the hunter jumper ring around our town. We just did it locally, but um, she found a lot of control being able to boss that 2000 pound horse around, you know, and, and it listened to her because she got bossed around by doctors a lot. And she really had no control of her body and in us and her, G tube and all this, and at, and she always said, "Mom, at the barn, I'm not sick." So we just kept bringing her to the barn, <laughs> and um, I, I think she felt in control of something for once in her life when she got on those horses. And still, to this day, she still has a horse. It's still a huge part of her life. It's she says it's her therapy, going out to the barn, and and um, you know, and I think her favorite days sometimes are when her horse is misbehaving and she has to get that thing back on track and she's, she works with it and sees results. Like 
she finds um, she finds a lot of therapy in that. And so we were lucky to find something she was so passionate about and really wanted to do. And we just kept making it work within our budget because horses are very expensive. <laughs> but we just kept doing it because of the joy it gave her. And it was a huge part of her life. And she did it all through college and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that helps finding something you're passionate about. When, when I was growing up for a long time, it was soccer. Um, I played so soccer for years. Um, and then I had some confidence issues too. And what really helped me with that was uh, I was in theater when I was in high school and, and uh, kind of confronting that, that fear of uh, doing stuff in front of people um, on stage that, that gave me a lot more confidence. Yeah. My, my kidney transplant was when I was 11 and it was kind of awkward because I, I hit, a, hit puberty at the same time. Um, and, and so I had all these crazy chemical changes all at once, not natural chemical changes, you know, through puberty. And then also all like the new drugs co co coming into my system. Like, like I, I, uh, I think my eyebrows changed to like two or three different colors that year. <laughs> year. Ser seriously, like at, at one point they were orange and, and then at, at one point they went, uh, like jet black and then and i had uh like the the roots of my my hair went black um which was kind of crazy um yeah yeah one of those drugs right that's the side effect <laughs> i think this is one of them that yes helps his hair grow <laughs> oh man and, and then I, I went on you know prednisone at the same time which makes you wired <laughs> makes me wired and i was on a higher dose at first so my my uh my appetite incre yeah. increased dramatically. Um, yes, and, and then the combination of, of hitting puberty and being he um, more healthy, I, I began to have more of the, uh, you know, the teenager appetite. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was a crazy, crazy change. I, in, in the span of like, I got it in between the summer of uh, fourth and fifth grade. And in, in the span of that time, it, if you look at my picture from fourth grade and you look at my picture from fifth grade, it looks like I aged like five years. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Um, as far as school and medicine, um, I was kind of lucky in that regard to my, my mom would have to go on and explain it like, like you did. Um, Joe, but after that, they they would the secretary would give me my medicine, and even I remember some points if I forgot to take my medicine, the secretary would go hunt me down, and and, and be like, you 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 gotta take you gotta take your medicine. <laughs> I had this vision of like the, the overhead speaker, Steve Schluter, come to the office. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh no! Oh, oh no! Oh no! It wasn't it wasn't uh, the overhead. It was uh, I was out. I remember once I was out like on recess and I, I forgot to take it. And uh, this uh, the secretary, I think it was kindergarten or something. The secretary came out and she was like this old, like uh, battle ax of a woman. And she came, came out and, and uh, was, you know, getting my butt like back, back in there um, to take, take meds. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think I definitely being in the same school system helped. There were little moments you know, just just very very in individual moments where there were a few kids who were, were kind of rough, um, but in general, I think compared to what it could have been, and, and you know, looking back in hindsight, it, I I was really blessed to be in that school system, especially since I've talked talked to other other people and other uh, other parents and you know heard heard uh, their situations. I think what some of you raised about that idea of having sort of a core set of people you know or a, a close friend that kind of can be an ally is, is such an important you know thing to think about like how do you structure that to make sure that there's at least a couple of people that you can kind of rely on yeah you know for any of that yeah. definitely I'm sort of thinking on the flip side we we talked a little bit about sort of um 
how adults are often the problem. <laughs> and uh, in terms of understanding and in terms of their reactions. And so I'm wondering sort of both as you're creating those social networks for your kids, sort of how you dealt with for the parents sort of how you dealt with maybe other parents um, and how you navigate some of those things like bedwetting and smell and need for meds and all of those while you're getting your child out there. Um, we would, okay, so yeah, you kind of have to, um, you know, you'll meet a lot of parents through your kids when they're little because they meet kids at school or in different social situations, um, whether it was the barn or school or wherever. Um, and you kind of got to pick your friends wisely. <laughs> there were families that we as Brian and I as adults really connected with well that it, Megan introduced us to or my son Tyler introduced us to. And we just really connected and became good friends. And those were the play dates we encouraged or we'd all get together like family dinners and stuff. And so they became better friends. There are families where you just, you know, not everyone is going to um, support you or, um, you know, keep your spirits up. And I think you really have to stick with those who make you feel good about yourself. And I always told Megan and Tyler that too, growing up, you know, if, if so-and-so is a tease or you don't trust them, you hear them talking behind other people's back and, and, and you don't feel comfortable around them, don't be playing with them. Go find, you stick with your friends that make you feel good about yourself, that you know you can trust. And um, so that sort of thing. We did a lot of, um, I didn't want Megan not to ever have sleepovers. So we always had kids at our house sleepover because I could still get up and do her things at night and she'd have her good friends sleep over. She did have a couple sleepovers at our friends, the Marshes, who are still our closest, dearest friends who we met through Megan when she was little. And I had to sleep over too because I had to do her meds all night long, but I wanted her to have the experience. And um, my girlfriend, Melissa was like, no, let her sleep over. She's never been to someone else's house and da, 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 da. So I, I left, she went over, I left. I came back at like 11 o'clock when I had to do meds, spent the night and I snuck out in the morning so she could have her morning time. But it was a lot, it was a lot for everyone. But um, we, when they were little, like Jonathan's um, daughter, Allie or Eleanor, um, we would do a lot of half sleepovers, which was fun because they'd come we'd have a kid over or Megan would go to someone else's house until 10 or 11 o'clock when they were really getting tired anyway. And we'd pick them up and bring them home. And the half sleepovers were great, <laughs> but they still felt like they're having a sleepover because they got in their jammies, they brought their pillows, they watched a movie, they did the whole popcorn thing. And, you know, that's kind of how we did it because of the bedwetting and because of all the pads you have to change. And, you know, they're getting pumped full with that pump at night of all sorts of stuff. And, we always had a bucket at the foot of her bed in case she threw up. She, you know, we had all those moments, but we just really tried to give her the experience as we could. I, I don't know if it's still around, um, but when, when I when I was a kid, um, in regards to the to the bed wedding, um, my uh, my mom she she found this kind of like vibration alarm thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and she, she would attach, I, when I was sleeping, it would be like a attached to me and every, and every time, um, I started to get a little wet, the, the, uh, the alarm would, would vibrate and wake me up. And so what eventually, what eventually happened is it trained me to, uh, to wake up when I was about to, to go to the bathroom, um. And, and and so that that eventually allowed me to be able to uh, to to do the uh, overnight stuff easy, easier because I I would just I was just trained to to wake up whenever I had to go even if it was like four or five six times a night or you know what whatever it was. Oh, um, that's so brutal. He never yeah. sleeps. <laughs> thing. I feel bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but uh, I well I got that like. I, it was, it was uh, second grade, I think, maybe maybe first. Um, yeah, and, and then uh, learning 
to swallow pills helped a lot too. I, I, I learned to swallow, yeah. swallow pills when I was uh, about six. And, and I know that's not possible for, for, for everybody. Everybody's situation is different, but, but yeah, that, that definitely made, made things easier. Jana, how about you? Uh, well, I have always liked the saying, it's better to have four quarters than a hundred pennies. So I think you figure out early on, you know, who those people are, who you can choose to. Um, and I know this is about bullying, but one thing that I struggle with is when people wouldn't take it seriously with meds. So uh, we're a blended family and, um, you know, when we had issues with uh, other family members or friends, you know, forgetting a dose of meds or several doses, I would just, I would lose it because, <laughs> you know, I, it is important and, you know, we only have this small window of, you know, when our kids are 18 or whatever, they decide to leave the house to let them know how important that is. and. You know, bullying is very important too, but I just want to drill it in his head that, you know, someday I won't be there to remind you and you are then going to be that person. So, you know, if there's adults or people who aren't encouraging him to, you know, do what he's supposed to do and stay compliant, then that's yeah, very important. And it's Jenna, funny. he doesn't have a transplant yet, right? He's still yes, on. Yes, he had a transplant oh, when he, he was 11. Okay. Yeah. Right, so missing those transplant meds is incredibly risky. Yeah, yeah. And Megan was twelve when she had her transplant. It sounds like everyone here. I don't know about the Healy girls, but had transplants around eleven or twelve. We actually, Jana had her transplant at twenty-eight, and I had mine three years ago. So when I was thirty-four, that was my first transplant. Good for you guys. It's amazing. Interesting. I think as cystamine has become more available, and yeah. especially as the drugs have gotten a little bit easier, right? The the time frame of how long people can last before <clears throat> needing transplant has kind of changed, in some ways. But what I thought was interesting is where it used to be a lot of folks getting their kidneys at 10, 11, 12. Then all of a sudden we had folks who were getting their transplants right as they were leaving for college which developmentally is such a crazy time to go yeah. through that, um, that, you know, there's, there's, there's pros and cons there of, yes, we've bought more time. Um, and of course, so much growth changes when you have a working kidney that yeah. that makes a big difference too. So it's complicated math to make sense of what, you know, what the best thing to do is. It is. It is. Yeah, I definitely think the uh, medication really helped with with being able to hold off for that long. I don't think we would have been able to have it that late if, uh, if without sustaining. Yeah, our mom and dad were on us, even, you know, when we were little, like five or six, we didn't, we didn't want to take it because it was the liquid stuff. It was the gross tasting stuff. I didn't want to take it, but if we, you know, if we tried to spit it out, then they would give us another dose. So we basically have to sit there until we took our meds. They drilled it in our heads that we had to take our meds in order to feel better. Yeah. I feel like we need another podcast, guys, someday about <laughs> the history of cystamine and the trials. Because oh, some yeah, of you are really, you were the folks who did yeah. that. And not everybody knows what that was like. Uh, it was not <laughs> fun. <laughs> fun. Yeah, it, it was gross. <laughs> this is even mixed with juice <laughs> yeah even mixed with juice oh it kind of tasted like you were swallowing puke basically oh. I, I i will i will say though um because <laughs> because that was so bad um it made almost everything else better um yeah <laughs> <laughs> Interesting way to eat okay, bread. I'll eat my vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <They're all plenty laughs> uh, <laughs> do you guys still take that or do you take ProSysby now? Um, I, I'm on ProSysby. Same here. Same here. Okay. Yeah. See, I'm Caleb honest. was the first person to start ProSysby without being on histanamine. So he has no idea how lucky he is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. He didn't have to uh, taste that stuff. Yeah. Oh, oh man. <laughs> We started out, um, so we, we actually started out with Prosysby as well. I, I, I find it interesting just be, I, I think a lot of, a lot of this has to do with compliance. You know, obviously 
Um, and, and so precisely being something you can take, you know, um, you know, Q six hours versus um, Cystagon. So Eleanor, we, we started off with precisely for her um, because, you know, you want to go for the Cadillac, right? You want to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like every, everything with Al has been, you know, kind of with like three or four caveats, like there's, you know, it's like, oh, well, yeah, you take the Precisby. Oh, my daughter doesn't swallow anything right now. And, you know, she has a huge swallowing power. So yeah. there was no way that we were able to get the pills down and um, oral them. That was obvious, you know, from, from the jump. Um, and so we, you know, we battled the applesauce flecked, you know, white spots all over everything, you know, and, and um, you know, trying to push this through a G-tube in theory, yeah, yeah, might work, right? You gotta, I mean, it's, uh, I'm so glad that I uh, am an ER nurse because there's little tricks and things that you can, can use to kind of flood that through. But um, when Elle moved over to a GJ2, um, when we found out that the G tube was just wasn't sufficient and she was still throwing up so aggressively, and you know, sometimes she was throwing up 30 to 40 times a day. Oh, and so you know, when we went over to the G tube, it became apparent that there's no way that we could get, no matter what the French on the G tube was, you just can't risk having the G portion of that, um, or I'm sorry, the J portion of that, um, clog, right? Because that's the way she gets her overnight feeds. And so we did, we switched over, we switched back to Cystagon. And so, yeah. um, that's really been, you know, I mean, literally and figuratively a lifesaver for her, for sure. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, it's the, the thing that I have just drilled into her head and, and I don't mean to say as like a drill sergeant or anything, but we, you know, we know that every time there's a med, I mean, we, we set it up, we've got a whiteboard there that shows her every time that a med's coming up, you know, and our mornings are, you know, 5 a.m. I'm up, you know, giving her her um, persistagon and her first dose of iron. And then after that, it's, you know, two hours later, it's a, it's a G2 push. You know, two hours after that, we're talking about endomethacin, right? You know, and so yeah, everything yeah. is so structured and, and, and there and ready to go. And I think that's the thing for, for me that I really fell into was, you know, understanding um, the minutia, but then also uh, we've got to hit these benchmarks every single day, you know, and every single day and, and, and stepping back from that big 10,000 foot view, looking at the totality of what this disease process brings about is enough to, to bring people to tears, you know, just how am I going to do this? How am I going to, how am I going to get her through this? You know, I know. Yeah, we've got cures on, on the way. How, I want her to, how do we get her to live? Like I need her to stay yep. alive. Yeah. understand you know what awesome things that are you know around the corner and what's coming up and so for me i've always pulled back from all of the cure talk and 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 we don't really even talk about that because you know number one i, I feel like it cheapens everybody else that has gone through what they've gone through all you guys that have gone through what you know these these long hours of just slogging through you know nothing but reducing therapy you know, and then we're just taking the meds just to make sure that you feel okay. And to now have this on, on you know, on the precipice here to realizing this, 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 this dream that everybody wants, you know, I, I found myself pulling back and just saying, no, we just have to do the next best thing every single day. Yeah. And we're not going to get ourselves out of our heads here and start thinking in, you know, in, in these big, 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 right. you know, big stre stretches. It's just, it's just about understanding how important it is, L, for you right now to take this med. And this med does this, and this one does that. And I always, you know, we told her from the get go, you know, like your body is, it's like this cave, and and you grow these diamonds. You have these little diamonds in your body, and 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 you have diamonds on the inside, and that's how rare you are. It's like, but unfortunately, oh, that's so cute. You diamond, right? You know, and, and so it was just a way to help her understand that, yes, she's different, but different is not a bad thing, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so we talk a lot about how, how unique she is and, on, you know, and, and what this disease has done to her, but at the same time, too, to understand that she doesn't take it. This is the reason why she feels this way. And, and, and so we, we make sure that it's something, I mean, at five years old, she, literally during her her g2 pushes knows exactly how how hard and how long to push to get over about 20 minutes of of the recommended feed that we have to that we put in yeah. and so she does it herself and she has a lot of autonomy there in doing it it's awesome we've just been yeah i mean it's just we've just been allowing her to to be at the forefront of her own care yes and then very definitely. honest with her about you know about you know the days when it's when it's not going to feel great 
and she knows. I mean, and, and I think the thing that I, I connected, you know, with Jill, I, I remember talking with Jill when we were in Pittsburgh and, and hearing the story of, of the horses and I was just in awe of, and I remember telling her, I was just like, I mean, I'm seeing all these adults for the first time and, and everybody looks so put together and just has their stuff together. It's just coming in here with your head spinning and whirling about, you know, am I ever even going to be able to walk my child down the aisle, you know, to get married, like all those oh, things, you know, as, yeah. if you're born, or as your daughter or your son, like, you know, and, it, and it's separate for, for me. Right. But the truth is, is that, you know, I think that the roundabout blessing here is that, and even with COVID too, right. It's that you develop this other worldly relationship with your kids. And I think everybody, I think I would put all my kids in there with that as well, but you just, from a very, very early, early age, you realize life is so precious. This, this is the only one we have. And so yeah. regardless if, if these, these years right now are filled with, you know, puke buckets and, you know, and rubbing on backs and, and constipation and all these things that elk kind of, kind of runs with in cyclical fashions, the growth hormone shots, the hard parts, right? They're, they bring us together. And so in, in, in Jill and Jan, I, 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 and I know you guys have this connection with your parents as well, those that are still here, um, that, that they knew that there was something going on when you knew something was going on. And I think it's those kinds of, of families and those family units that really signify success, you know, over, overall success is those, those families that are kind of obsessively, you know, in tune with what their kids are feeling and making yeah. sure that, that their needs are put first. And, and I think that's the thing that I always, I never like it to be about me. And yeah, there's a lot of sleepless nights and, and we're doing a lot of extra work and I'm a bartender on weekends just to make ends meet sometimes. But at the end of it, it's so worth it. You know, it, it's absolutely so worth it. And um, I mean, I, I think I think you're, you're right on. Um, I, I know that there's gonna be interactions with, with sleepovers and whatnot yet. I mean, right now, it's not really something that's really come up just yet. Yeah, we did have a, we did have an issue a couple of days ago with a family friend. Or I'm sorry, a next door neighbor. That I don't really know all that well, but um, they watch their um, their children's kids. So their grandkids are always there. And, and the other day, like, two little girls just popped up in my house out of nowhere. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> you know, and, and so it became, you know, it was just like, oh gosh, John, it's happening, right? And like you, you know, like she's there are kids that she hangs out with and friends and and I, I, it kind of scared me a little bit because it was just like is this really how quickly it happens like is this just like <laughs> in COVID and all of a sudden I've got like two other kids you know that are coming in and want to play with L2 and, yeah. and so it, you never and, I, and I'm so protective over the kids already and so I, I just I just want to make sure that you know we're doing all the right things and, and I, I have this kind of idea that until I trust you I don't trust you. <laughs> right. You know I mean? so, yeah. so, you know, I vet everybody that comes around L because, you know, these are very, very formative years for her. But yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's essentially just kind of setting, setting her up just to win as much as we can and realizing that there's going to be times where I don't have everything planned out and I don't have it figured out and, and recognizing um, that those mistakes and, and those things happen. Um, I'm, you know, there, there will be a time where I know I have to let her go to some, 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 I, I know that there'll be that time. Yeah. It's not, it's hard. Yet. I'm not worried yeah. about that just yet. And, you know, but I, I have a lot of faith and understanding and, and hope that if you guys got through this with the little amount of support that you had in the beginning, and I don't mean that from the standpoint of family, I mean, more so from the standpoint of all the new technology that we have now and all the things and advances that we're going through now. Yeah. Um, Health, telemedicine, kids being able to go to school online and doing those things. Um, back in the day when I was younger, and I'm about to be 40, I mean, we didn't have those options whatsoever. You know, I went to parochial schools, and you were in class the entire time, and that's how you had to do it. You know, and um, yeah. we might have a nurse, we might not have a nurse. You know, and so a lot of the things that you guys are talking about now, you know, I, I'm essentially kind of trying to find to find ways to mitigate those things. Um, knowing though that I can't make a perfect playbook for everything that comes in, you know, and so um, I have, I have a lot of hope. And I think that's the thing that we want to instill in hell. We always have a hopeful disposition on, on what's to come instead of kind of looking at things with dread, you know, and so for her, she struggles a lot with some anxiety right now. And that's something that I absolutely see and understand. I mean, she's been through um, some of the worst trauma that any child her age would ever want to go through. Uh, right. You know, getting, 
getting straight cath to do a bladder scan when you're you know three years old with nurses who are looking at this kid like why aren't you feeding your child you know and me with this seething of <laughs> rage inside pulling these residents aside and and letting them know like yeah you guys work at the number one number two children's hospital in the country but literally 60 feet over that way i run an emergency department one of the top trauma centers in the u.s as well and i know these doctors that you're working with and i know the plan of care and i know what you should and what you shouldn't say mm -hmm. you know? I think that was the biggest thing for me is, is flexing those muscles when I needed to and putting people kind of back in place, you know, when they say things like, it's incredible that your daughter's still alive. We wouldn't expect that she would be alive right now. You know, and this is, a, you know, a 22 year old resident that, you know, for all, yeah. you know, wet behind the ears and has just gotten out of medical school. And, you know, I feel like those are really, really important teaching moments for me as, as you know, a parent to let them know that, you know, this, this patient is more than just a disease process and that they're more than just what these lab, you know, labs are showing. And, and um, you know, because I, I don't know if you guys can, can relate um, because you were children when it happened, but, um, but as the parent, I mean, the parents know like the phone call that you're probably gonna get when the blood work is off. Yeah. Like yeah. I know when Elle wasn't feeling great. And I knew that when we would go in for some blood draws before she was diagnosed, that I was probably gonna be getting a call. You know, yeah, yeah. Call comes in that her sodium is through the floor. She's got no potassium. What are you doing? How could you? What are you feeding this kid? You know, and, I can't believe that's still happening today. Yeah, I mean, and, that and, 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 right. And and so I find it. I think one of the things that I would love to be able to develop, um, you know, in this new role in the executive board is just some protocol for for new doctors on bedside manner. I think that that would be incredible. I mean, I think yeah. that I think that they may not know it and may not realize it, but, um, you know, being able to communicate is one of the biggest things that leads and breeds to compliance in yeah. any disease process. It's the thing that I rely on so much as an ER nurse wasn't like all the life-saving stuff I was doing. Anybody can be taught to put the lines in. Anybody can be taught to do a level one transfusion on somebody that's dying, anybody. Um, but what I can't teach you is how to make sure that you don't come back to see me. What I can't teach you is understanding how to give you those next steps to be your best self and to own whatever this disease is. And I think yeah. that with, more, with more clinicians, and I have a lot of hope with all the incredible doctors that I've met through the network. And, and you know, I have hope that that's something that, that can come about because I'll tell you, the thing that really scares me the most, and this is being just completely honest, the thing that scares me the most it's being one of these kids that's now an adult that comes into my ER. It's like I've never been in an adult ER before. And just remembering some of the people that they had to deal with and how livid I would be if I was a parent realizing that my child had to go through that. Yeah. You know, um, and that's the scary part. I think the transition from pediatrics over to adult and making sure that that same level of care that you've cultivated. And I've only been doing this for two years now, but I have really, really gotten this group and this team to a level and a spot where I think we're perfect. We're talking together. Everybody knows what's happening. They know what my expectations are. I know what theirs are. The deliverables are all there. It scares the hell out of me when you, I, you switch over to the adult side because that's a side that I live in. And yeah, it's not that's another conversation. We had a hard it's time with that too. The good news is, I mean, I think in the medical world, the conversation about transition is so much different than it was mm -hmm. 10 or 20 or 30 oh, yeah. years ago, you know, that there's, there's some hope there. And, and Jonathan, this is why I want you to, you know, I'm dragging you into rare disease day to talk oh, to yeah. up and coming doctors and health professionals and whenever, and you know, we've done this, Sarah and Jana, right. We're at, uh, did their poster last year. Like we're always taking opportunities to like, how do we teach? the generation of healthcare providers coming up right. so that those conversations are different. Because I think all of you have talked about sort of being in situations where you didn't get listened to or, or your knowledge wasn't of the illness wasn't respected by the healthcare providers that you were in front of. And that's a really frightening moment. It is. And Jonathan, I want to say, I think our cystinosis community is really lucky to have you on board from because you have such a great perspective you are working hands down you are right in there with all these er people you understand how that all functions you know 
I go in there as, as just a parent of a kid, but you've seen both sides. You've gone in as a parent with a kid, plus you are the recipient of all these people coming into the ER. And um, I think we're just really lucky to have you. So thank you for everything you're doing. I think you're just a huge advocate for everyone. It's reciprocated. So, yeah. I definitely think you guys give me way more than I give you. <laughs> <That's all> I <laughs> definitely. Well, you're being humble, but you are. You're an amazing father. Eleanor is going to do fantastic. Yeah. She's going to do great. And, and you'd mentioned some uh, before about um, not really speaking to a cure, not really sort of looking at that aspect. And I think, I think I really appreciate you bringing that up because I've thought about that with sort of the stem cell research uh, on the on the horizon and actually happening currently. Um, I think that's important because then I think if you talk about a cure, you talk about a cure, you talk about it going away, you talk about it going away, um, sort of the cystosis going away, it, it sort of lessens who you are. It doesn't, it kind of takes away who that individual is. Like, no, we don't need to keep looking at that. That's sort of like constantly looking forward, constantly looking for something, constantly searching and, and wondering, and you're not really just living and, and learning who you are and appreciating who you are internally, like all the things that you can bring to this world and, and all the things that, that make you who you are. And I, I appreciate you saying that because that's super important. I just wanted to add that because you brought that up and I, mean, I, I really appreciate you saying that. Absolutely. Absolutely. How, how strident of me to come into this. I mean, I've said it many, many times that if there was one thing that we're lucky is that we've come into this, this community um, right right on the cusp of a lot of changing things, you know, a lot of changing things. Um, yeah. But I always, and it's, and it probably is just, you know, maybe my, my sensibility just as, as a man in general, but then, you know, dealing with, with people with, you know, life altering, life changing terminal diagnoses in the ER mm -hmm. and, and, and dealing with those immediacy, like those acute things when, you know, a family member passes away from something traumatic you know, you see how important the time is right in front of you right there versus mm. that, you know, that kind of projected stepping back and looking. I mean, there's time to do that. I, I definitely think there's time to do that. But I, I just remember, and, and, I, and I remember um, we went to a Horizon Therapeutics. There was an event that they put on. It was the first time I was ever involved with anybody with cystinosis. But, you know, my head was already whirling, you know, with the diagnosis. And then, you know, somebody calls and says that they want to pay for, you know, the next four days for you to go down to Tucson, Arizona, to some incredible hotel on like a golf course. And all I'm thinking <laughs> about, I love the golf. And all I'm thinking about is I don't, I, I me and my wife is pregnant. We don't know whether or not, you know, our baby that is six months, you know, in utero right now has cystinosis. Everything is just enveloped in, in this kind of feeling of just dread. And then when we get out there, or I get out there because uh, because my wife couldn't fly and Eleanor was still too sick at that point in time. And I remember getting out there and just realizing again, like I, want, I, want, I literally went up, went up the steps, I remember it. And it's like this grotto and everything and there are all these people like with tea times and everything. Everybody's walking around doing their own thing. And I'm, I'm literally just like, my head is just underwater because this yeah. doesn't seem, nothing, nothing seems normal right now. Like I playing golf, like what is that? Like I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm, not, I'm never gonna touch that again and I walk up into this, this spot where they have all this food laid out and there are like two kids come right around the corner, like between like four and seven years old, shirts off, one is shirt open and they're, you know, one of them's looking at each other like, look, look, I got one too. And they're pointing down to the G2. And I mean, I just, I lost it. I was just like a puddle of mud, like, oh my God, God. like I just started crying because it's, you know, you don't, there's nobody else that knows that story. You know, nobody else that knows that, you know, that feeling of trying to get everything right, but just getting it wrong, you know? And um, I have so much respect for the process, but also where we've, where we've come, you know? And so I just, and, and, and I, I don't want to harp on it because I know that you guys don't go through this, you know, this journey that you're on to be kind of the face of cystinosis or be the warriors that we all know you are but it's something that you have to kind of take on too. You know I mean? You have to also realize how incredible and unique you guys are as well. And so I just always felt like for me to come in and ignore that huge, huge elephant in the room about everybody that's been through this and has been through. I mean, I think of you guys as like the OGs, right? Like the originals, you know? Um, 
And it's incredible. I mean, that is so much more rewarding for me to see you guys and hear the story than to hear about another trial, you know, seeing success. Like, because that's real, that's real for me. You know, if, right. if as we've always told out, you know, it's, I, I don't tell her about a cure because I have to operate as if maybe she's not a candidate, you know, like maybe she's not in the inclusion criteria and maybe she's just not going to be able to get it. So what do I do then after, you know, I've, I've built her up for the last five years thinking something's coming to the pipeline and then it goes away. That's the last yeah. thing I do. I want her to own, uh, own this and have her know that it doesn't define her, but also right. know that you know, she's in direct control of how her life is going to go from here, right? And and I think that that was kind of the other elephant in the room is that I saw some some kiddos and some families and some patients there that were not doing well. And it was obvious that some of these families had not been compliant with the medication. And so for me, that was also a very sobering moment to realize, John, like you, you've got a responsibility here. Like, I don't care what you got to do. And I sat there in Tucson hearing a story about a girl that, um, that almost died because when she was between 14 and 18, she just decided that she was done with the medications. And, you know, she had three or four really, really, really sentinel events in the ER that, that popped her out of it, you know, but at what cost, you know, and she had needed another kidney transplant because of it and, and some, some damage to her organs as well. So those are the kinds of stories and the things that, that I, they obsess over, over and above, you know, the cure. And, um, I just, you know, from, from my lips to your ears. You guys are incredible and you know that's that's the reason why i feel like it's my duty to dedicate as much of my time outside of the things that i do that i care about which is you know basically keep my family healthy and happy so this is just an offshoot of that um and especially i think that you know that these events the a lab and the ability to come in a candid moment and and, and have these talks are are so important I think Jonathan has brought us to a conclusion pretty effectively. <laughs> I think we yeah. should wrap there. I think we could have a whole other <laughs> conversation about uh, compliance and adherence in another afternoon, right? <laughs> There's lots of challenges there. Yeah. Um, but certainly, I think thinking about sort of all the strategies that folks have taken advantage of to get to where you are, um, you know, is so good to hear and so important for the community to hear. So, yeah, thank I'll you, everybody. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. R really appreciate you. Thank you. Spending our, our morning together. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for yeah. doing this. It was, yeah, it was great hearing from all of you. And we really appreciate you joining early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs>